Sometimes I wonder if these barbed wire fences are to keep people out or to keep me in. They never let me leave until the motors are humming again. Anywho, we're back at a pump station and we've got a size 3 motor starter acting up. But instead of fixing it, this time we're going to replace it with something fancy. Well, hello, Mr. Fancy Pants. And look, the light even works. Nothing beats the light of a two-foot fluorescent. Reminds me of home back in the insane asylum. I'm grateful every day that they pulled me out of that place for this work-study program. Maybe that's why they keep me behind a fence. As you can see, this cabinet isn't in too bad a shape. Someone did put this sketchy power monitoring in and didn't feel like drilling any holes. Got some big old motor starters, classic NEMA size threes. Wires are falling off the door, but of course they are. We all hate stickies. Probably going to fix that. And it looks like we have some rodent friends. I can't imagine how they got in through this mahosive conduit. I don't know why the conduits are so big, but whatever. I bet it was an easy pull. This is another old school can station, but they did upgrade it to where the electrical components are up top. So that's a little better. That latch doesn't work. This one's not super deep, but it's still going to be a pain going up and down. Luckily, I don't have to go up and down a lot for this project. Got some spider friends hanging out. At least these aren't black widows. They love to hang out in these sorts of places. We'll go ahead and get rid of these webs so I don't have to catch them with my face on the way down. A lot of people were rightfully concerned in the comments of my other video where I went down in a dry well because they didn't see all my safety precautions, but I don't always show them in the videos. As you can see, this dry well has a blower that runs downstairs. You can see it blowing on those weeds. It also has some built-in fall protection. I keep a gas detector on my truck at all times because I don't want to take any chances. You just don't always see it. I also carry a portable blower, full tripod and fall protection. In this case, we're not going in the wet well, which makes it a little safer, but you still have to follow the confined space procedures. These are set up in a wet well drywall configuration where the two chambers are separate from each other. Always stamp on the lid. I never go in these confined spaces without having another person with me as well, but they're ugly as sin, so I definitely don't show them in the videos. I get confined space certified every single year, but ultimately, the only person you can trust with your safety is you. Anyway, let's get in this dry well and see what these pumps are looking like. So it looks like we got a 50 horse pump with a 61.5 FLA. So whatever we put in to replace this motor starter needs to be able to handle that. One of the reasons we're not just fixing the motor starter is we want to switch technologies and not just for electrical reasons, for some mechanical reasons. So we are going to be using a soft start. This soft start is actually a little oversized, but I like to do that with soft starts and drives if they let me get away with it and if the frame size is still the same, because I feel like it doesn't have to operate at its limit. Now I'm sure that's a waste of time and money, but it seems like every time I do this, I very rarely have issues in the future. As you can see, in this case, the soft start really isn't much bigger than a regular size 3 motor starter, or at least a NEMA one. But before we start, we need to make sure the pump that is going to be running the station actually works. Don't start tearing everything out until you know it works. Looks like it's pumping, so we'll put our alternation in 1-2, that way we never get a lag pump, and we can start work. We got a pretty simple setup here. We got a 100 amp breaker feeding our old motor starter. Nice little service loops if you're into that kind of thing. And obviously we have our overloads and our load side out to our motor. In terms of controls, still pretty simple. We got our coil wires. We got one auxiliary contact, the built-in one on the left. And of course we have our neutral coming into our overload contact, which we should all know about by now because I already made a video on that. We also have plenty of room on the right side to scoot this thing over. We don't have to scoot it over, but I'm gonna put the soft start on the right side and then put some terminal blocks in the middle to kind of leave room for all our control wiring. We'll go ahead and verify that everything's off. I actually ended up turning power off to this entire cabinet when I was doing most of the work. And then I would just flip the breaker back on when I needed to actually use one of the pumps. If anyone doesn't know what a soft start is, it's basically a device people use when they're tired of changing contacts out, but they're too poor to buy a VFD. I'm just kidding. It's actually a good alternative to motor starters. It's basically the modern version of the old auto transformer. It's just a device that starts the motor at a reduced voltage, which in turn reduces the current. Now, I'm not going to lie. When I first started, this didn't make a lot of sense to me. I thought less voltage means more current. 
But when you think about a motor, you gotta realize when it's not moving, it's basically just a big shorted coil of wire. So a soft start not only feeds that with a reduced voltage, so you're not just slamming 480 volts into a dead short, but it also limits the current. That allows the motor to create that magnetic field and actually start spinning before you slam the full voltage on. Quick side note, I like to use tape to keep my components from sliding around when I'm trying to mark them on the backplate, because those backplates are slippery as hell. Then I take the tape off when I'm done. Anyway, back to soft starts. Why would you use a soft start, not just use a VFD? Well, the main reason is cost, but they also require a much larger footprint. They require cooling. They require special VFD cables. They require line reactors. They take up a lot of room and a lot of money. So if you do not need to maintain a reduced speed, a soft start can be a good option. You get a soft start and a soft stop, and it takes up about the same amount of room as a NEMA contactor. A lot of modern soft starts even have bypass contactors built in that will switch the motor over to full voltage once it's ramped up. And they can even be used as emergency bypasses to the soft start itself in certain instances. Those used to be external on the old soft starts and they still are on some of the really big ones. But either way, you're doing a lot better than a contactor and you're taking up a lot less room than a VFD. Just make sure you don't have one of those old school soft starts that didn't break the center leg of the circuit. Those things were sketchy as hell. Whoo, danger, danger, danger. All right, now we got this big girl mounted with some quarter 20s. We can start working on some of our smaller stuff. We're going to go ahead and mount some DIN rail between the old starter and the new soft start. This is where our terminal blocks will be. And that's just going to switch from the old wiring to the new wire and give us a nice little spot to do that. I left the DIN rail oversized because there's a possibility that pump one may get done in the future. So I went ahead and did myself a favor and left the DIN rail a little long so we can fit those extra terminal blocks in the future. Of course, that's about the only favor I did myself if I end up being the next person that does this, which of course I will. We actually got really lucky in this situation because the cabinet was so oversized. Sometimes you're not that lucky, especially when you're working in an MCC. If you're trying to stuff one of these in a motor control bucket, sometimes it's just not gonna happen. The soft start I'm using here is a Schneider Alta start, but in reality, they all kind of do the same thing. They just all have slightly different features. Either way, you're doing better than a motor starter. All right, now I'm gonna start on the line side power wiring. I'm actually reusing the old wires because they were sized correctly. I just straightened them out and recolor coded them. I believe it's number four THHN. I know it's rated for 125% of the motor FLA, so that's all that really matters. And I know I'm a hack for reusing the wire, but there was nothing wrong with it, and I did restrip the ends. The stuff was basically brand new. One thing I will say about retrofitting these old cabinets is you kind of got to turn off your OCD for a little while because it's never going to be perfect because you're not redoing the whole cabinet. If you're redoing the whole thing, you could follow your own great standard and make it all perfect. But the fact is, there's a lot of old wiring in here that's not getting changed and is going to stay like it is. So you should at least do better than the last guy but you also have to realize it's not going to be perfect. For example, I wasn't super happy about tapping off the line side of this soft start for the control transformers, but it's the best option I had without adding a whole nother distribution block. So I just wrapped them around and made sure they were tight and it is what it is. So let's move on to the load side. I'm going to start off with my grounding like you do, especially since it's behind all the other wires. I didn't have my crimper with me, so I didn't use a big ring terminal. I just attached a mechanical lug to the grounding stud, which is fine for this installation anyway. And then we go ahead and hook up our brown, orange, and yellow. I did put little service loops or whatever you want to call them on these. I'm usually not a big fan of that, but the PMs that get done at these stations require taking current readings. So it is nice to have that spot to attach your meter to. They used to have them on the line side with the old ones. But I moved it to the load side because I wanted to. And of course, we got a fresh coat of tape on that too. Make it nice and pretty. And speaking of nice and pretty, the door is not. It's not nice and pretty. But we do have to add a few things to it. Or at least I'm going to because I am extra. I'm going to be adding a fault light and reset to the door so no one has to open the cabinet to reset anything. And oddly enough, they never had overload resets on this door. So that was the only way to reset the overloads, which of course is not a good idea because then people have to be sketchy like me. And we don't want that. So let's go ahead and measure some holes out so we can add our two devices. These are going to be 30 millimeter devices because that's pretty much our standard. Always use the pilot hole, make sure I didn't drill through any wires. Go ahead and drill a half inch knockout for our arbor. This is pretty much what I do in every video. 
and I still am using the same method because I still don't have a 30 millimeter carbide hole saw, which would be pretty cool, but I haven't even bothered looking it up. So we're still using the punch. I don't even have the proper wrench this time, so I got a big adjustable wrench, but it's all the same thing. Speaking of that 30 millimeter knockout that I'm wrenching through, here's a pro tip with any knockout set. Don't store it with the cutter facing the die. When it's rattling around in your van, it will dull the crap out of that cutter. So always make it so the cutter is facing away from the die. Something I learned in Votec, but I've always done it that way. Go ahead and nibble our little notches. Apparently that tool's called a nibbler. Someone in the comments told me that. And we're good to go. Got our new devices on there. In terms of the control wiring, we are using 120 volt control wiring. LI1 will need power. LI2 is the actual start signal, which used to go to the coil of your motor starter. Common and CL2 both need neutral, in my case. CL1 is the control power for the soft start that you can break to reset. So that's actually going to go through our reset push button. And when you break that circuit, it resets the soft start. And then you have your relay wiring. It has relay one and relay two. I'm using relay one as a run status, which will go to the existing circuit for the run light and hour meter. So power to common and then run status from normally open. And then same concept with the fault. It'll be power to common and then the fault status will be the normally open. I'm not going to lie. The diagrams for these things kind of suck, but once you do it, it's really not that bad. Those are pretty much the basic things you need to get this working minus the relays. You don't have to have the relays for it to work, but I'm using them. Some soft starts also create their own control power, like 24 volts DC. They act more like VFDs, but they're all fairly simple. If you can wire a motor starter, you can probably wire a soft start. And if you can wire a VFD, you can definitely wire a soft start. It's all the same concept. There's our control wiring halfway buttoned up, and I figured I'd take this little moment to tell you about this labeler. I have a lot of people ask me what labeler I'm using. This is a Brady BMP61, and I am not sponsored by them, and I will prove that by telling you I don't really like this thing. It's way overcomplicated. You gotta have the right ink and the right media, which I know isn't that big a deal, but the stupid thing has computer chips in the actual labels, so if it thinks you're running out of labels, even if you aren't, it won't let you print. And if you're using the wrong ink, it won't let you print. And there's a million other things that won't let you print, and it drives you nuts. I'd rather do it wrong than not be able to do anything. Even if I'm doing it wrong, at least let me do it wrong. You can warn me, but let me do it. And don't get me wrong, it's a fancy labeler, and it has a lot of cool features. It's just way more than the average person needs for labeling wires or labeling basic stuff. I'd rather have a smaller, cheaper, simpler one. Also, the labels are like comically expensive. All right, that's enough complaining. Let's move on to the door. Like I said, I want to redo this part of the door because all the wires fell off. I have to add actually only two wires to the door, but while I was at it, I redid the stickies. I drilled in a few bolts to actually mount the bundle properly so it doesn't rip the stickies off in the future. And we're just going to kind of halfway clean this up. It's definitely not going to be perfect because, as I said before, we're not redoing the whole thing. And we're certainly not redoing the whole door. So the wires didn't really lay in the best way, but it will be a lot better than it was. A lot of people did recommend to me different brands of stickies and different kinds of adhesive that supposedly last a lot longer. And I did read your comments. I just haven't purchased any of them yet. I will try them at some point though, because as we all know, and as I have been mercilessly reminded, stickies are the devil, but they are the devil we know. And for now, I'm just going to make the best of them. Now I only have to run two wires to this door because I already have a neutral and a hot on the door that are associated with this pump's control transformer. You don't want to make the mistake of just grabbing any hot because there's two control transformers in this cabinet, but those are not the same thing. Those are not the same hots. So luckily we already have a neutral and a hot, which was pretty obvious because we have push to test lights. So they require a neutral and a hot at a minimum to work. So all we really needed was two wires back, one for the soft start reset and one for the fault light. Now, when you go to program this thing, they do give you a quick start guide, which is about four pages, but the actual manual for this thing is much more substantial. You can program this with a laptop and it's a free software, but I usually do it with the buttons because it's really not that complicated. It's not that hard, Scott. Tell him, watch. It's incredibly hard. For the most part, you're just changing your basic settings, like your current, your voltage, your start time, your stop time, 
You can also change the starting voltage. It's default, I believe, is at 30%, which is fine for our application. There's a few different options for the overload settings. I just leave the trip class on 10 because that's also fine for what we're doing. I did have to go into the advanced menu to change what one of the relays do because you can configure that, but it really wasn't a big deal. Anyway, that's all the programming. Let's give it a shot. You knew that was going to happen. As you can see, the display changed and tells us it is accelerating. And once it reaches its full speed, it says run. And then after a little bit, it will switch to showing us the motor current, which is a nice little handy tool. And when we shut it off, it tells us it's decelerating or ramping down. And then it should go back to ready. So that's good news. Let's have a comparison between the old and the new. Very nice. Now let's look at the difference in current when starting. Now with a regular motor starter, you can reach currents of eight times the FLA. Let's see, we got 383 amp peak. I do have the meter set to peak current. And on our soft start, 83. So that's a huge difference. That's a lot less strain on your electrical system. So everything seems to be working. Put our alternator back in auto so both pumps run like they should. Always put your pumps back in auto if you don't want the operators to be mad at you when you start spilling shit everywhere. And a final look at our work. Like I said, the door could have been better. Obviously, everything could have been better. But that's just excuses. I think it turned out all right. I also left plenty of room to do pump number one if the powers that be decide we are going to do that. And I'm sure I'm going to be the one that deals with that. I really should have run extra wires to the door for doing number one. But... You know, I'll just be cussing at myself later, but that's that job done. Turned out pretty good. I think the soft start is a very good option, but I did forget one thing. Oh yeah, can't forget that. So there you go, soft starts. They're cooler than motor starters and not as cool as VFDs, but uh, you're probably gonna see them and you should probably be using them. So see ya.